Laos, a land ruled by the Mekong, one of the world's mightiest rivers. The Mekong is fed by tributaries hidden deep in pathless canyons. It is a whim of history that centuries have passed with hardly a human foot trespassing in this wilderness. And so today, Laos can still boast a wealth of natural wonders. Uncharted rivers. Unclimbed mountains. Untouched forests inhabited by mysterious creatures. Laos is a last hideout for some of Asia's big wild animals. Home to dozens of indigenous tribes and cultures. And keeper of a Buddhist tradition long lost elsewhere. So in the very heart of crowded and buzzing Indochina, there is a wonderland still on the brink of its first discovery. In the northern province of Hua Phan, a zoologist is on her way into the jungle. Arlene Johnson is a specialist in tigers. Vieng Tong is the vantage point of her expedition, a village on the fringe of the Nam At Phu Lui protected area. Arlene and her team are on a mission for the Wildlife Conservation Society, or WCS, and the Laos National Forestry Department. When we started doing our field work in 2003, the goal of the project was to um, understand better the distribution and abundance of tiger and their prey in the Namet Pului protected area in northern Laos. Fifty automatic cameras will be installed in the mountain forests. They will record anything that moves. Only during the dry season can one travel here without sinking into deep mud. A camera team will accompany the group and try to install a video camera, along with the stills cameras. The first camera trap will be positioned at a walking distance of two days. Laos has no access to the sea, yet it is a land of water, dominated by the mighty Mekong. Beginning at a point where three countries Laos, Thailand, and China meet. The Mekong runs southward. It forms a long borderline with Thailand and leaves Laos in the south, thundering over the Kong Fa Peng waterfalls into neighboring Cambodia. It is a spectacular and noisy exit. Minam Kong, mother of all waters, is what the people of Laos call their river. In the south, the Mekong is as wide as a lake. This waterscape is called Si Phan Dong, the 4,000 islands. When the rainy season starts, most disappear overnight. Over a distance of 1,900 kilometers, the Mekong carries goods and people, irrigates rice paddies, and fills the nets of fishermen. This river produces more fish than the entire Mediterranean Sea, an annual two million tons. The Mekong boasts one of the world's highest degrees of biodiversity, Scientists know many of its species only from hearsay.
These murky floods are home to a legendary monster, the giant catfish. Weighing 300 kilos, it is the world's biggest freshwater fish. Only a few people have ever seen a giant catfish, but the fishermen in the northwest, near the Thai border, have hunted the giant for generations. But even at the height of the catfish season, all we can find is one Thai fishing boat. Laos has recently prohibited the catching of catfish because the species is threatened by extinction. For hours, the Thai sail up and down the river, only to return home with empty nets. What has happened to the giant catfish? If there is an answer, it is found on the Thai side of the river. Like the Mekong, the northern mountains are also full of secrets. The Aka people live along the Chinese border. Many of their villages can only be reached by foot, journeys often lasting several days through thick mountain forests. Hunters like Suenyo are familiar with plants and animals no white man has ever seen. He still uses the traditional Chinese crossbow. Firearms are prohibited. The hunters set out for the woods to try their luck. Unlike many Laotians, the Aka are not Buddhist. For them, a hunt is also a visit to the realms of spirits, where rocks and plants are animated beings. Each Aka village has a spirit swing. It's the gate to a mystic cosmos. It's built in honor of the dead and must never be touched. The Aka came here from southern China. In contrast to the land of their origin, their villages in Laos still have a traditional look. No tin roofs, no electricity, no plumbing. The women's decorative headgear is a highly visible symbol of the Aka culture. The Aka women are expert in needlework and weaving. They dye the fabric for their clothes with indigo. Even though the men are hunters and trappers, the Aka are mainly farmers. They clear the steep forest slopes with fire and they plant dry rice and vegetables. The hunters have long disappeared into the jungle when the women set out on their way to the market. Selling a few vegetables is the Aka's only source of income. The main market in the north is right on the Chinese border, in Muan Sing. The market punctuates the region's cultural complexity of nationalities, tribes and languages. The south is populated by Thai and Khmer. The north by peoples from Tibet. Burma and China. Laos boasts more than 60 officially recognized ethnic minorities. The north is dangerous ground. The Golden Triangle is close. Clandestine poppy farming, drug trafficking and smuggling of goods of all kinds are challenges to the government. Even the wilderness is beset by serious problems. Poaching and illegal trade with exotic animals are a threat to the tiger population and other rare jungle species. This is why the government supports the work of Arlene Johnson and her team. Wilderness research in Laos 
is a tedious adventure. We have a cursory list of animals that are existing here, and which is probably fairly accurate with a, you know, a few other species that can be added to that list. But as far as the ecology and the distribution of the majority of these species, I would say we're just in the early stages of understanding that. None of the researchers have ever seen a tiger eye to eye, yet they have little doubt that the big cats are nearby. In an abandoned batch of banana trees, they set up camp for the night. Hot water with forest herbs and rice is the usual dinner. The majority of the expedition team are Laotians. The assistants and porters are excellent jungle scouts who can read animal tracks. At night, the temperature sinks to five degrees centigrade. The lightly clad porters shiver while playing cards. The area to be investigated is set out in squares. The camera positions are carefully defined. But the Louis protected area spreads across three and a half thousand square kilometers. Looking for tigers in this rugged mountainscape seems hopeless. Shielded by mountain ranges and forgotten by the world, Laos has preserved wild landscapes hardly found elsewhere in Southeast Asia. Traditional culture, too, has miraculously survived the region's violent history. In spite of its ethnic diversity, Laos has been a predominantly Buddhist country for more than seven centuries. On the Mekong, there is a city that seems to consist of nothing but temples. Luang Prabang, once capital and royal residence, is now a world cultural heritage site and the country's religious center. Colonial architecture, the only remaining heritage of 60 years of French rule. Inhabited, living, and crumbling architecture is everywhere. The orange worn by the Buddhist monks sets the visual tone of this city. Every day, just before sunrise, the monks come out to receive alms, rice, vegetables, and sweets. Monks are prohibited from worldly labor. They take their arms without any expression of gratitude and return to their temples. Even the oldest temples are wide open to the life of the city. They serve as meeting places, passages, and playgrounds. Water snakes, so-called nagas, guard the roofs. Everywhere there are animal images, symbolic protectors and sources of strength. In Laos, one animal is worshipped above all others, the elephant. In the era of its glory, Laos was called Lansang, realm of a million elephants. A three-headed elephant was the royal coat of arms. Today, the number of elephants in Laos is nowhere close to a million. Nowadays, even working elephants are only found in remote provinces. They are still used in terrain, unfit for tractors and lorries.
there is a Laotian speciality in dealing with elephants. Whilst in the rest of Asia, elephant guides use a sharp metal hook that inflicts pain, Laotians direct their animals only with a gentle voice. Nothing is more endearing than a well-trained working elephant, but their wild cousins are very different. In contrast to their African relatives, Asian elephants generally do not live on open grassland, but in dense jungle. We never even noticed what the local scout saw immediately, a young elephant male in the immediate vicinity. The elephant is only 20 meters away. Males will not tolerate strangers anywhere near. Our scouts opt for a quick retreat, and it's soon obvious that this was the right decision. There are few places here that offer a wider view. This forest clearing is a meeting place for elephants who are attracted by a natural salt deposit. The animals dig up the ground to get vital mineral supplies. The number of wild elephants in Laos is 500 by some estimates. Others believe that there are 800. In any case, Laos has the most important national elephant population in Indochina. How could hundreds of elephants, each one as big as a bus, remain undiscovered and uncounted over decades? One reason is that systematic field research has only just begun. Another, that forest elephants in Asia are more difficult to observe than elephants on an African savanna. If the Aka hunters had ever wanted to know the precise number of elephants in these forests, they would certainly have been more successful in counting them than Western researchers. But to them, statistics are a typically Western whim. While we, with our heavy packs, stumble clumsily through the underbrush, the Akka seem to glide along the jungle paths with little noise and effort. Under the canopy of these giant trees, Outsiders easily lose their bearings. You hear bird calls, but cannot tell from where. You think you walk in a straight line, but find that you move in circles. We need supermarkets, the Aka need the forest. Here they find food plants, medical herbs, firewood, building materials, honey, and animal protein. The other hunters have moved on, but Soenyo has picked up a rustle in the foliage. Alert, yet calmly, the Aka hunter uses his crossbow.
The bird is not dead, just injured. Almost as fast as his arrow, Sueño has caught up with his prey. Within seconds, it is packed away. It's a delicacy, a pheasant. The Aka are allowed to hunt pheasants, but not protected animals, such as the tiger. One would readily vouch for the innocence of these gentle people, yet tigers are caught and killed in Laos. But the poachers are shrouded in as much secrecy as the tigers themselves. Several hundred kilometers from the Aka hunting grounds, our expedition has reached the first camera position. First of all, the WCS scientists want some basic questions answered. How many tigers are left in this area? What is their prey? How large are their individual territories? Where do tigers and humans clash? You see there are four connectors and here are three. The service team is being briefed. Our camera is to operate for six months. Video cassettes and batteries need to be changed on a weekly basis. For the WCS project, the young men have to position 50 stills cameras spread out over 100 square kilometers of wilderness. In comparison, working our two video cameras is easy. Both the video and the stills cameras are triggered by an infrared beam. In contrast to the video cameras, the stills cameras need no service. They operate in their isolated positions in the forest for over a month. In recent years, these camera traps have enabled scientists to capture some spectacular shots. In 1999, one of the world's rarest animals was camera trapped in Laos. A sowler. This species is most closely related to wild buffaloes. Only a few years previously, the sowler had been discovered in Vietnam as a new species, thanks to a pair of horns a biologist found in a hunter's house in a remote village. In Laos, any sort of animal can end up in a frying pan. Although trade in wild animals is now prohibited, no one seems to worry about the law. This is why markets are obvious hotspots of field research. Just like Arlene, WCS biologist Rob Timmins was ambling through a marketplace in central Laos in 1996 when he noticed an animal for sale which he could not identify. A striped rabbit with short ears, a species so far unknown to science. The list of newly discovered species also includes two kinds of rare small deer, a rat with a furry tail, and a yellow pig. They were all found between fruit and vegetables, or in village huts, smoked or dried. Arlene and Veni Vongpet seem to have no luck, but then they find next to rats and mushrooms a giant gliding squirrel, an uncommon species that they do not regularly see. Really? That's a beautiful one, huh? Very nice. Oh, 
Tong Pan. Oh, okay. okay. Oh, this is a big one, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Huh. Yeah, it's definitely... Definitely East Asian porcupine. <laughs> Big animals such as porcupines have become rare. Hunting pressure is on the rise, and forests near densely populated areas have been effectively depleted. Illegal trade in exotic animals is another problem. For a rare turtle species, collectors will pay almost any price. Yeah, it's a definitely a soft shell turtle, but doesn't have. By now, Arlene's team has some experience with rare animals. One of their cameras captured an Austin civet, an extremely rare species. One night, a hog badger released the trigger, a little-known species in Laos. It's the first photograph in this country taken in the wild. The common name is red-cheeked squirrel. In spite of new discoveries, what the scientists find in the markets is worrying. It's a confusing image. On the one hand, animals are recklessly hunted. On the other, researchers discover ever new wonders. Yeah. Yeah. Arlene and her Laotian colleagues are convinced that in spite of mounting problems, Laos is Indochina's last natural paradise. Nowhere else is there so much terra incognita, land and wildlife that is little known to science. The limestone labyrinth of the Pu Hin Boon National Park, the Anamite Mountains on the Vietnamese border, the primeval forests, rugged canyons and uncharted rivers are this country's most precious treasures. adventurers and scientists, when they think of Laos, this is the place of their dreams. However, their enthusiasm for this wilderness has nothing to do with dreaming. They simply know that many species could not survive anywhere else. Hornbills, for example, need an abundance of wild fruit and ancient trees to nest in. This is why they are only found in primeval forests. The same is true for the tiger, the elephant and the Asian black bear. These bizarre limestone formations are an ideal barrier against invaders of all kinds. Though draped in lush greenery, the rocks here are needle sharp and brittle. There is no route over the mountains, but there is one right through them. The Nam Hin Bun River in central Laos has undermined the porous rock and created a cave seven kilometers in length. Better still, the cave is actually a tunnel suitable for boats. This natural tunnel is up to 100 meters wide. In places, its ceiling rises high to form underground cathedrals. One can only guess at what is hidden up there in the dark. For brief moments, stalactites and snowy white sandbanks glisten. 
Stranded jungle giants shimmer in the gloom. During the monsoon, the water level almost reaches the ceiling. In the dry season, it sinks to a low of just a few centimeters. In this labyrinth of crags and jungle, natural-born climbers like the white-handed gibbons have it made. Clumsy humans, scrambling along between rocks and underbrush, need an entire day for a distance a gibbon can do within minutes. Gibbon pairs stay together for life. Juveniles can be recognized by their light coat. A juvenile will accompany its parents for two years and is tenderly cared for. This small family alone needs a territory of 20 hectares. White-handed gibbons depend on a diet exclusively of fruit. Only large forests can cater to such needs. White-handed gibbons totally avoid ground contact, only swinging from branch to branch, at breathtaking speed if necessary. Apart from birds, they are the fastest moving species in the canopy. Climbing like this seems like defying gravity, but it takes training. The aspiring junior has not quite reached his father's elegance. Mid-April, Luang Prabang is beginning to celebrate the Buddhist New Year. New Year is a time of cleansing, symbolically as well as physically. Family home or temple, all across the country people are now busy cleaning. Washing the statues with sacred water is a good deed and a sign of renewal. The spirits of the old year are driven out. New spirits will come with the approaching monsoon. Days before the actual holiday begins, all the people are out and about. Profane feasts take turns with traditional customs and religious rituals. To avoid evil surprises at rebirth, it is necessary to lay up good deeds. Selling songbirds in tiny cages is now big business. People buy the birds to release them as a climax of the festivities. Tiny fish serve the same purpose. The markets are busy and loud but there is a place of sacred silence down by the Mekong. Two hours by boat upstream are the cave temples of Paku. Many legends are told about this shrine which is visited by pilgrims from across Asia. Over decades, believers have left thousands of Buddha figures of bronze, 
wood or clay. Time and these figurines have turned Paku into a religious site of world renown. April is not only the month of New Year, it is also the giant catfish season. We are now on the Thai side of the Mekong, but there is no trace of catfish. Remembering the biologists in Laos, we decide to do some market research, and this method proves successful. Unfortunately, our first catfish is dead. It is a rather small specimen, but it's definitely the species we've been looking for. This fish comes from a fish farm. Catfish are being bred from the eggs of animals caught in the wild. There is no way this fish could have been caught in the Mekong. Juvenile fish, larvae or eggs have never been found along the 4,000 kilometers of the river's length. The only encounters have been with adult animals in the delta and right here before the monsoon. Yet there is not a single fishing boat out there. Why? If anyone can provide an answer, it is Kriang Sak. All his life, the fisherman has been after catfish. The biggest one he ever caught, he says, weighed 280 kilos. Each year, his crew used to catch two or three giant catfish. In a good year, up to seven. In the early days, they were very heavy, he says. We sold the fish to the Laotians for a small fortune. Today, people hardly go fishing anymore. It's also prohibited by the government. Whenever we catch a catfish, we can only keep it long enough to weigh it, and then we have to release it. Who goes fishing in order to release a fish? When he was younger, there was up to 60 fishing boats on the Mekong. And at the beginning of the season, both Thai and Laotians used to celebrate a big feast. Pangasius gigas, the world's biggest freshwater fish, is threatened by extinction. As recently as the 80s, some 60 giant catfish were netted each year. Now there is a total of two or three. The reason is the reckless exploitation of the catfish population. Thailand, too, is now considering a radical protection law. Otherwise, the giant of the Mekong will soon be history. Hopefully, the mountain forests will render better news. For six months, the video camera and the 50 photo traps have been out in the forest. The video camera has taken many pictures during daylight, but there are no animals to be seen. Possibly large insects have crossed the photoelectric beam. At night, the camera records infrared images. An entire week passed before the first picture was taken. Stealthily, as if it had got wind of the camera, a red muntiac, a small deer species, sneaks by. Giant bats chase through the night air.
Many nights later, a Samba deer appears. This species is about the same size as a European red deer. And another Samba, always alert, ready to break into flight. It's obvious that this area offers prey for a big cat. One day when changing batteries, the service team discovered tiger tracks near the camera. So there is at least one tiger gliding through the jungle at night. Did he only pass through or is this his territory? Perhaps one of the photo traps can tell us more. Arlene and her team would be more than happy with just one shot of a tiger, proof of its presence. A month later, they dismount the cameras. Little do they know that they already hold a sensation in their hands. <laughs> Over the dry season, the cameras are distributed across several hundred square kilometers of the protected area. Getting them back is a tedious job. The crew are nervous. Have the cameras worked? Were they placed correctly? What will be on the films once they're developed? A few weeks later, in the WCS office in Vientiane, the capital of Laos, more than 2,000 photos of the dry season's trappings are laid out on the table. We were very thrilled with the results. Um, in fact, we found a really high diversity of, of carnivores, large and small carnivores, at the site where we've been working, which has been exceptional in Indochina. Okay, and then here again, like this site, look, we had, this is uh, Namapui 6. This is, and then we had... In the protected area, there are at least six okay, cat species, animals. as well as 14 other carnivores. Some of them never photographed in the wild in Laos. Many predators on the red list for this region walked by a camera at least once. And here are the stars. A clouded leopard, as rare as the blue Mauritius. An Asian golden cat, night active and rarely seen by humans. A leopard. The number two in the ranking of big cats. A pair of marbled cats, a practically unknown species. From black. But the biggest surprise of all. Okay. Mm, so not far away at all. In the survey area, five different tigers have been photo trapped. Mm -hmm. yep. So moving almost across the entire block. From this, it could be projected that at least seven, perhaps up to 20 tigers inhabit this part of the park. The most important result of the WCS project is the realization that in spite of poaching and trade in wild species, this area is still a refuge for tigers, one of Asia's last. It's not too late for protection measures. From the Akas perspective, the nervous counting of threatened species is a Western obsession. The men will hunt as long as there is anything to hunt. And if one day the animal should disappear, it's not the fault of crossbow and rifle. The most serious threat to Laos and its natural wealth is forest clearing and the consequent loss of soil. Compared to the rest of Asia, Laos's human population of 5.5 million is small and yet it's growing dramatically. A 
illegal timber harvesting here, a controversial river dam there. Progress knocks loud and hard on Lars's door. <laughs> The New Year's celebration revolves around water. Other ingredients are flour and deafening noise. Like an explosion of life, the annual celebration sweeps through the streets of the time-honored city. Loang Prapang and its otherwise quiet inhabitants have changed beyond recognition. <laughs> the official climax is the big parade. In a palaquin, Prabang, the country's most important Buddha statue, is carried through the streets. The parade is said to follow a precise choreography. If that is so, it is impossible to recognize for a stranger. All the ethnic groups are represented. There are dancers, beauty queens, and dignitaries. And after a while, the parade dissolves into a wild party. The masses flow down to the Mekong Island, a large sandbank that only appears during the dry season. otherwise quiet Mekong turns into a chaotic waterway. The source of the merriness is not just brandy and beer, but the joyful expectation of the monsoon. The air is hot and the land parched. The rains will soon bring relief. As a salute to Buddha, the families build carefully decorated temples and stupas of sand. Now it's time for good deeds. Finally, the poor songbirds are allowed to escape. And the fish, those who have survived the journey in their plastic bags, can now return to the river. Soon the Mekong will wash away the footprints, the spits, paper plates, bottles and huts. For three months, water will be the dominating element. Cascades of it will rush from all the mountainsides. Where the young fisherman is standing now, there will be deep water. In some places, the Mekong rises 15 meters. It will flood the plains, feed irrigation channels, and make the rice grow. In southern Laos is the sprawling temple of Vat Pu, erected by the Khmer people in the 11th century. Its weathered stones tell of the decline and fall of the Khmer kingdom and all the past rulers of this region. Over the centuries, Burmese, Siamese, and French occupied the land. Laos was devastated by American bombs and communist experiments. But the vicissitudes of history have come and gone like the changing seasons.
In the end, Laos has emerged as what it has always been, an enchanting yet stubborn wilderness and a land of farmers. A land not ruled by kings, but by the monsoon and the Mekong. A natural wonderland. <laughs>